kia ora i te whanau, uh, pai te kite, um, um, Good morning everyone, it's great to see you. And whether you're um, watching this with your neighbourhood community group or maybe you're watching it with your family or a friend, um, or just by yourself, I want to thank you for, for tuning in and listening in uh, today. Um, we're uh, expecting that um, next week we're going to be able to gather together as a a church family uh, all together at um, the, the, our facility in Greenwood Street. And I'm so excited, as I know many of you are, um, to be able to do that. And uh, so I want to uh, encourage you to uh, yeah, make plans to be there uh, next uh, Sunday, Palm Sunday. It'll be a great celebration. But we also recognise that, um, that we're not out of the woods yet. This isn't over. And uh, there's still people in our congregation, in our community, who are um, contracting uh, Omicron and uh, COVID-19. And so we want to make sure that we consider it and careful about how we re-engage with people. There are vulnerable folk within our midst, and some of them may not be able to attend initially, or they may wish to wear a mask. And others of us may uh, want to wear a mask also just to try and... Um, protect others. So we, we ask that you respect that um, as we continue just to um, move through this uh, this time. <clears throat> Over this uh, past weeks, we've been having a series on Lent. Uh, Lent is the time of uh, reflection, of uh, fasting, of repenting, of praying, of consecrating ourselves or offering ourselves back to God. Um, and ultimately celebrating uh, with Resurrection Sunday. And it's a time at, as uh, we approach Easter that we're able to really think about Jesus' life, his, his ministry, his teaching, and uh, the difference that he makes in our lives. Churches across the centuries have followed uh, a pattern of, of readings, and uh, these are what, what I've been uh, selecting my passages from, my, my teaching from, week to week. They, they each draw on the life and teaching, uh, the ministry of Jesus Christ, or the um, history and, and the experiences um, of Israel and God's dealing with them, or indeed the new community that uh, God established uh, when Christ returned to heaven and the Holy Spirit was poured out upon the church. And the teachings of the New Testament highlight the significance of Jesus' sufferings and what he achieved for us on the cross. You know, it was Jesus himself who taught that if anyone wants to be my follower, they must uh, deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow him. And what does that look like? What does it mean for us to follow him? What does it mean for us to take up our cross daily uh, here in the um, 21st century? What does it mean for us to take up our uh, cross, to deny ourselves in this COVID-19 season that we're in. I'm going to read a passage now from Isaiah 43. It's a very familiar passage. Uh, you'll probably recognise it immediately and some will already know what I'm about to read. It's Isaiah 43, verses 16 to 21. This is what the Lord says, He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and the horses, the army and the reinforcements together, and they lay there, never to rise again, extinguished and snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals will honour me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the desert and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I form for myself, so that they may proclaim my name. Let's pray together. Lord, as we take time now to, to think on, to meditate on, to discuss uh, this passage and other scriptures. 
Lord, I pray that you would speak to us in fresh ways, illumine things to us, and give us understanding. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, as I said, these are familiar um, verses. In fact, David Costa shared them in one of our services towards the end of last year. But the reason that they uh, they resonate with us uh, so so much is because uh, this chapter really speaks of God's redemptive grace. That how God deals with His people is is uh, is is seen here. It's the heart of the gospel. It's the good news uh, that we have to proclaim. And I would just say that as you reflect back on your life, as you think about the ways that God has dealt with you throughout your life, there's a clear difference between the time that God was active in your life and you were responding in faith and obedience compared to the time um, before that when you were just doing your own thing. But it's amazing how easy it is for us to look back and to dwell there and to think about the good old days or the things that happened that we, we really enjoyed or we really appreciated or God moved in, it in, in, um, in, in ways that we, we long for him to do again. We can end up dwelling in the past or living in the past. And that's what it says there in verse 18. God says to his people, forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. Don't expect those past victories to sustain you into the future. And don't let your past failures define you. Last week, one of the scriptures uh, that was included in the reading was... Uh, in 2 Corinthians 5.17, anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And we are to reflect on and to remember that past with gratitude. Our past experiences can truly stimulate faith for the future. But the former things or the things of the past cannot be used to stereotype or to place expectations on God of what he should do or what he will do in the future. You see, God reminds Israel that when they were in Egypt, he rescued them and he parted the sea. And then he drew the Egyptian army uh, to be buried into the See, But he says, now, even though you are slaves in Babylon, I'm going to do a new thing. I won't do it the same as I did in the past. I'll provide water in the wastelands and streams in the desert. He says that even the wild animals, and in fact the, the animals that are mentioned, are, were unclean animals uh, to, to Israel. Uh, the jackals and the owl were animals they weren't to have anything to do with but it says, even the wild animals will come under God's blessing. Wow. Joseph and Leslie, last October, were here with us and we had some great meetings together. And on the Saturday night meeting, Joseph shared a passage, a message from that passage in, in Joshua um, chapter 3. And he focused particularly on verse 4, where it says, we haven't been this way before. And he was talking about how um, God uh, led Joshua in a different way to how he led Moses. And uh, I'll make sure that the link to that, it's on YouTube. You can find it for yourself, but I'll also put a link um, onto our, our website and, and Facebook page. Now, Jesus was always being confronted by people who thought that he was doing things in a way that wasn't appropriate. And yet he was came to show a new way. In, Rome, in, in John chapter 8, there's a classic encounter where it illustrates this so well. There was a, a woman who was caught who had been caught in adultery, and the religious leaders brought her to Jesus, and they asked him how they should be dealing with her. 
They said, you know, the law of Moses tells us that we should stone her. What do you say? At that point, uh, Jesus just knelt down onto the ground and started writing in the dust. It's interesting, Jesus, we're not told of any of the writings of Jesus. We don't even know what he wrote in that dust, but that day he wrote into the dust. And then he said, those of you who are without sin may cast the first stone. And as he waited, all of the people drifted off. And he was left alone with this woman. And he said to her, where are your accusers? And she said, they've all gone. And then Jesus said, and I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. You see, he was the only person who had the right to stone her. He was the only one without sin. And yet he chose not to. He was showing God's new way, God's different way. The way of redemptive grace. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul's talking about all his uh, uh, activity before he became a Christian, all of the ways that he tried to prove that he was a good person, how he tried to make himself right with God. And as he reflected on that, he said this, I have discarded it all, counting it all as rubbish so that I can gain Christ. I press on to gain what Christ has gained for me. Forgetting the past and looking forward, I press on to reach the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And, you know, many of us can be tempted to, to dwell in the past, to live with the familiar, to rest on our laurels, so to speak. There are some who are constantly embracing change, but for many of us, we feel challenged when we are asked to let things go or to no longer trust in certain things or, or to have a new approach to something. God's already begun to do some new things and it may be a challenge for us to be able to recognise them. In verse 9, he says, look, I've already started. Can't you see it? Don't you perceive, perceive it? For some of you, this will be something very personal. God's doing a new thing in your life. And it feels uncomfortable. And at this stage, you're not recognising that this is from God. It just doesn't feel comfortable. It doesn't feel right. God says, I've already started. Don't you perceive it? Don't you see it? For some of us, it's in relation to our church, our church family, the way we've done things, the ministry that we've had together. And I really believe that we are entering into a new season, a time of change. And it feels difficult, but I believe God is in it. And this morning, as we spend some time together, I'd like you to talk about the things that maybe you've begun to recognise that God wants to do in a new way. And for some of you, you'll be able to share about some personal things that God is asking you to let go of, to be able to experience a new thing. And for others, it'll be talking about what's going on for us as a church community. And as we look towards coming back together, we're not coming back just to do things exactly the way that it used to be. There will be changes. Some will be noticeable from the start and some will begin to, to happen um, as we go forward. But it'll be a time for us to let go of things. And a psalm that I'd love for you to, to use during this time of discussion and to read together at the beginning of it is Psalm 126. It's one of my favourite psalms. It, it's in a group of psalms called the, the Songs of Ascent, or as um, they're, they're the songs they used to sing as they used to walk up to 
Jerusalem up to Zion, um, up to the temple as they went up for their um, celebrations and worship. Sometimes I refer to them as the, um, the original hill songs. But it, Psalm 126 acknowledges the journey of letting go of things. It talks about sowing in tears, but reaping with shouts of joy. My prayer for you this morning is that as you talk together, yeah, there may be some tears, but there'll also be growing expectation that there'll be a time of reaping and shouts of joy. Let's pray. Lord, as we come together, we recognise that um, you are above all things. You're our protector. You watch over us. You're our leader and our guide. Your Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, and he leads us into truth. And so we thank you that going through this time, we can be sure of your presence and your help. May you minister through your body and by your spirit to one another in this time now. In the name of Jesus. Amen. May the amazing grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the extravagant love of God our Father and the intimate fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Kieto, kietato katoa, te atafai o te tato eriki a ihu kuraiti, me te araha o te atoa, me te whiwhinga tahitanga ki te waro o tapu, a ki a ki. Amen. Well, um, looking forward to seeing you all next week. Uh, Kaikite te, te rawiki. God, God bless.